least Ted Nelson can claim the creation of hypertext. But does he? Hypertext is obvious. <laughs> so I do not claim to have invented hypertext, I merely discovered it. It's, it's like the telephone. Now the telephone at the time seemed to be an, inven an invention to, to us now. It was a discovery because it's obvious. Okay, so hypertext is like that. To me, it was simply the obvious next step of literature. What is hypertext? Hypertext is non sequential giving. Excuse me too, Ted. I must get back to the World Wide Web. Tim's solution for the world's particle physicists turned out to be a solution for everyone, helping to network incompatible computers. CERN wasn't in the internet business, but in 1991, they published the code, and within four years, the World Wide Web was sending more packets than any other internet service. That existed and figured out a way to put them together uh, and make it work. Uh, it was a tour de force. The people who did the World Wide Web were really willing to take uh, existing pieces of things in god-awful condition in some cases and figure out a way to make it work. And the World Wide Web people deserve a lot of credit for what they did. I mean, what they did was very difficult. The web is success precisely because it is not a monolithic new software product. You don't get web 9.0 in the mail on CD-ROM. The web is a collection of a whole bunch of small technologies that fit together because a, you know, a couple dozen people all thought about how they'd work together cool. And they're all being evolved constantly in real time by thousands of people around the world. And there isn't any central release. You can't go anywhere to go buy a copy of the web. The fact that the World Wide Web did work, I find it's not just exciting for itself, but exciting for the whole idea that you can have an idea, you know, some idea and it can take off and it can happen. Uh, it means that sort of dreamers all over the world should <laughs> take heart and not stop. The web was a huge step toward wiring the world, but more changes were to come. One of these happened far from CERN and far from Silicon Valley, too. It happened here. U.S. government money made possible the ARPANET and the Internet. But there was a catch. There was no commerce allowed on the net. When this restriction was finally lifted, it wasn't Bill Gates or any of the other digital titans who turned the Internet into a commercial marketplace. No, it was the folks on the hill, the custodians of capitalism. It was Uncle Sam. Roll the drums and sound the trumpets for the congressman from Virginia's fighting ninth district, the Honorable Rick Boucher, who in 1992 amended a law. Here are the historic words which made all the difference. This future ubiquitous network for voice, video, and data communications of all kinds will connect homes, schools, and workplaces. It will constitute an essential ingredient for our future economic competitiveness and will open new worlds of information and services for all of the nation's citizens. This is Congress speak for you may now buy and sell things on the net. What made it easy to do so was one more software breakthrough. Time for another word from the cringely glossary of geek. This word is browser. It doesn't sound like much, kind of a laid back word, but there's nothing relaxed about the browser because it changed the face of the internet. Here's how the Internet looked in the 1980s. Lists of text. This is Stanford University, but you'd hardly know it from looking. It's not very user-friendly. It's actually hard to find what you want, and frankly, it was mainly a tool for nerds. And then came this, an attractive, easy-to-use shop window, a gateway to the riches of the Internet. This is a browser. And just as the Mac made a PC into a computer my mother could love, the browser opened up the Internet to everyone. It was not at Stanford, but on a Midwestern campus that the second great innovation of 90s internet technology took place. Here, a bright kid named Mark Andreessen was earning minimum wage at nights, writing code in a supercomputer center. His prototype browser was a piece of software called... We ended up sort of in the middle of the night starting this project that we called Mosaic. What we were trying to do was just put sort of a human face on the internet. The internet at that point was a tool for researchers and scientists. For years, Bill Joy had been telling me that someday we'd back a 21-year-old kid who would write software that would change the world. And lo and behold, sitting in my office is this 23-year-old, not a kid. I mean, he's a very mature, hulking, <laughs> uh, young executive. And uh, Mark said this software is going to change everything. For me, this whole thing started exploding with, you know, mosaic well, to the average person through this ritual interface. You didn't have to know these arcane protocols in order to access the internet. Mosaic put a face to the web. 
and Mosaic plus the web then finally gave us a way to express to the non-technical person what all of us in computing knew was the tremendous value of having networks interconnected. And now everyone's a webhead and everyone's excited about the web. Those ideas have been present for 20 years, but it took a killer application, clearly Mosaic. Mark's Mosaic browser spread across the internet like wildfire. It brought him to the attention of an ex-Stanford professor who had already made millions from one startup and felt like doing another, Jim Clark. I said, look, if you can, if you can um, recruit all of the guys, every single guy who helped you write that program, then I'll put my own money in it and we'll just start a company and figure out some way to make a business out of it. And that's, that's exactly what we did. I put $3 million in. We flew out to University of Illinois, four days later, signed them all up. After a brief tussle with Illinois over the Mosaic name, Jim and Mark's new company became Netscape. Their product was a Mosaic killer, Navigator. Jim's plan for the company was, well, minimalist. But my attitude was, if 20, 25 million people are on the net today, one million of them are using Mosaic. This was, bear in mind, April 94. Um, and we can displace Mosaic. There's 24 more million people who would like a product like this, presumably. And the, market, the, the size of the net was doubling roughly every year and a half. So I meant by the time we had our products in the marketplace, it would be 50 million people. So you've got to be able to make money with 50 million people using your product. And that was, that was the sum total of the business plan at that time. It, it didn't take a rocket science to figure out that there was a big market here. And uh, we had uh, one meeting with Jim and Mark after that, decided to invest, and then set about on a crash program of 120 days to hire four vice presidents and a world-class CEO and get the Netscape product shipped. Well, Web fortunately, time. fortunately, you had the money. Uh, fortunately, I had the opportunity. The money was easy. It was the, knowing the opportunity and recruiting the people. Well, in about a year and a half's time, we had 65 million users. The most rapidly uh, assimilated product in history. In other words, no one had ever achieved an install base of 65 million anything. In fact, I don't know if anyone had ever achie achieved that kind of install base in anything, except perhaps Microsoft. So, and Beanie Babies. And Beanie Babies, okay. In 1994 and 95, Netscape was known as the fastest growing company in the industry with all the requisite Valley attributes. Shiny, low-rise buildings, Generation X workforce, and a parking lot reserved just for roller hockey. Today, they're famous for the fact that they're going head-to-head -head with Microsoft. The folks at Illinois did some clever work early on. Now, that happened to include Andreessen and you know Netscape got formed, but there was some clever work done at Illinois. There's always going to be some clever work done someplace that's not here. Hopefully there's a lot of clever work done here too, but there's always going to be some clever work done someplace else. And number two, we had a big thing we had to get done called Windows 95. And while we managed to get a browser done and built in because we weren't asleep, it didn't get the same kind of passionate forward, 100% focus that we love to give things because we had a lot of that focus already into doing the basic job of Windows 95. And so a little bit of cleverness and a little bit of sort of other priority was all it took to create a window. That's how dynamic and competitive this industry is in which Netscape emerged. We also were making money on it. <laughs> you know, that was it. We, our first full year of business was $75 million in revenue and the next year was $375 million. We were until Microsoft kind of came in and punched us in the face, we were the fastest growing company in history. It's another example of right With his Navigator time. browser um, dominating the internet, these were sunny days for Mark and Netscape. The storm would come later.